uh, welcome everyone to this series of uh, seminars. Today we have the talk by Professor Nikita Nekrasov. Uh, he received his PhD in physics from Princeton University under the supervision of Nobel Prize winner David Gross. After graduating from Princeton, Professor Nekrasov held postdoctoral position at Harvard University and then the Institute of Advanced Studies. He is currently professor at the Simon Center for Geometry and Physics and the CNA Institute for Theoretical Physics at the Sony Brook University. Uh, Nekrasov is known for his work on supersymmetric gauge theories and string theory. He has made important contributions to the understanding of instantons, monopoles, and other topological objects in these theories. He also developed new methods for calculating the partition functions of supersymmetric gauge theories. Nekrasov work has been recognized with several prizes, including the Jacques Herbrand Prize, the Hermann Weil Prize, and the Composito Prize. And this year, he won the Danny he Heinemann Prize for Mathematical Physics. So congratulations on this new award. Nekrasov is a leading figure in the field of mathematical physics. His work has had profound impact in understanding of supersymmetric catch theories and string theory. It is an honor to have today with us, Professor Nekrasov. Thank you for accepting our invitation. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to participate in some way of uh, the scientific and cultural uh, development of uh, Latin America, among other, other places. Uh, I am um, an avid study uh, scholar of, of Latin American culture. And uh, so I'm happy to give something in return. So today's lecture is called The Count of Instantons, which is kind of a summary of what I've been doing in theoretical physics in, uh, in, for the last 30 something years. Uh, I will start maybe at something very elementary, but then we'll gradually go to more advanced topics. Okay, so uh, as you know, the natural studies, the studies of nature can be roughly classified into active and passive approach approaches and uh, an active approach, we try to interfere with nature and see what happens. In passive approach, we think that we don't interfere, we just observe and reflect. And sometimes we combine these approaches in first making some experiment and then thinking of about its consequences, its uh, significance for many, many years later. And so the my, my, my main interest today is the story of uh, gauge theory as the theory of fundamental forces is basically a combination of these two approaches. So there is a lot of uh, experimental data which uh, feeds the quest for, for the theory, but uh, lots of developments, uh, in particular in the last uh, century came from theoretical, uh, in particular mathematical, uh, way of thinking about these things, and then later, later confronting the uh, these predictions with the, with the experiment. So the building blocks of our theories are actually quite simple. The, these are uh, oscillators, bosonic and trinonic. And by, by, by oscillators, we really mean the one of the simplest possible uh, algebraic structures, uh, namely, the operators whose commutators are uh, numbers, like on the left here. So these are, this is called the Heisenberg algebra. And so the right-hand side depends on the anti-symmetric matrix, which, which tells you how the uh, left-hand side, um, so the left-hand side measure, measures how things do not commute. And uh, the next algebra is called the Clifford algebra, where you, instead of the anti-commutators, you deal with, uh, instead of the commutators, you deal with anti-commutators. And so the right-hand side depends on the symmetric matrix. Now, if the number of indices which label the generators of these algebras uh, is finite, then usually you find such algebras in description of quantum mechanical systems of uh, spins or finite number of particles. And uh, again, the simplest starting point, which you know, everybody knows, of course, is a particle moving in a harmonic 
oscillator potential. So that's an example of the algebra with just uh, two generators, capital X hat. One is called usually P hat, another is X hat. And so one represents the coordinate and the momentum. And by taking a linear combination of coordinate momentum, you, you uh, uh, get an algebra of uh, creation and annihilation operators, which can be represented in the simplest Hilbert space whose basis is labeled by non-negative integers. And one operator A, the annihilation essentially lower, lowers the, uh, the index of the basis vectors uh, and, and cat uh, with the square root of uh, prefactor and another raises it. Now, even in the simplest, simplest quantum mechanical system, something interesting can be observed which is the source of the developments which we'll be uh, studying today. And that's the emergence of uh, complex, complexified phase space and complex trajectories. So let's think, so let's look at the simplest model and let's compute the transition probability, uh, namely the amplitude of uh, going from one point X initial to another point X final. So these are coordinates on the real line. And so this particle moves in this potential. And uh, it's a transition amplitude. Uh, in other words, it's a matrix element of the uh, evolution operator, except that now I will make this evolution operator slightly more general. Namely, I will uh, allow for the time parameter. So the time which takes to go from point X initial to X final to be a general complex number. Of beta. So usually in, in quantum mechanics, we take this parameter beta to be purely imaginary, and then uh, it's, so it's written like i times time, and that time would be the real time. Or in the study of systems at finite temperature, we take beta to be real, and then beta has a meaning of the inverse temperature. But uh, mathematically, we can ask the question, what is the analytic dependence of this transition amplitude of uh, dependence on, on beta? And we can uh, give the path integral representation for this quantity for general complex value of beta. And uh, so you, it's actually useful to think about this problem because uh, you would think that and I, sometimes you hear it or, li, or read in textbooks that when you take beta to be a real, it means that the time uh, becomes uh, rotated in complex uh, domains. So time, time becomes uh, imaginary or time becomes real if beta is imaginary. And uh, on the other hand, time is something which parameterizes the trajectory. So if you ask what is time for general complex beta, you might get confused. So when you think about it, you realize that time is always something real. So it's one real dimensional object. Uh, so we, if you like, we can just parameterize the trajectory by parameter S, which goes from zero to one. And then this parameter beta is just something which multiplies the Hamiltonian. So uh, the harmonic oscillator Hamiltonian is obtained by quantizing the classical Hamiltonian, which is the simplest quadratic function on the phase space, the sum of P squared, the kinetic term over two plus omega squared X squared over two, the uh, potential term. So we want to understand how to compute the path integral with the general complex parameter beta. Well, it's a quadratic integral. So it's, I mean, it's a Gaussian integral, it's an integral of exponential of something quadratic. And therefore it's dominated exactly by the contribution of the critical point of the thing and the exponent. I should apologize. I uh, set H bar the Planck constant to be equal to one. So it's my choice of units. Um, so we need to solve the equations describing the subtle point of the thing and the exponential. And these equations look familiar, but slightly maybe weird. They look like Hamilton equations with some strange prefactors. And so you can solve these equations by going to the classical analog of the uh, creation and annihilation operators, which I wrote as a complex variable Z, which is omega X plus IP divided by square root of two omega and Z star, which is, which looks like complex conjugate of Z, uh, but there is a caveat. So Z and Z star are complex conjugates only when X and P are real. In general, Z and Z star are just independent complex 
uh, valued uh, variables. So they parameterize equally well uh, the position of a point in the phase space, except that as we will see in a second, this uh, X and P will be in general complex value. So the equations, these Hamilton equations uh, trivialize in the Z variables, they solved in one line. Uh, we need to obey the boundary conditions for our problem. Namely, we want to know, we, need, we, we know the values of the X variable, the X coordinate at the beginning and, and the, at the end of the trajectory. So from that, we can compute uh, Z naught and Z star naught. And from that, we can, we can compute the trajectory. And so here, you might again read in textbooks that, well, uh, it's the same, it formally has the form of the motion of the trajectory of motion of a particle, either in the usual oscillator potential when beta is imaginary, or uh, in the inverted oscillator potential when beta is uh, uh, real. And so when X initial and X final are real, this trajectory for beta real or imaginary is real. However, it's not true if you take into account the phase space picture. So if you take into account the momentum P, it is not real even for um, beta, which is real. So there is this I prefactor, which makes it imaginary for, for the Euclidean time motion. And so for general beta complex, uh, either X or P or both are complex valued. So the trajectory never fits the real phase space. It, it, it does not belong to the real phase space. And what it means, it means that the path integral actually uh, is, a, is computed by deforming the counter of integration uh, away from the real, from the space of real fields to, to the uh, domain of complex uh, valued fields. And that becomes more uh, kind of prominent if you add interactions. So we can consider uh, now system with uh, self-interaction like unharmonic oscillator. We can add uh, different types of uh, interacting terms, uh, which depending on the various signs could have, you know, one minimum or several minima. So here I uh, plotted two examples of symmetric unharmonic oscillators. One, the orange, I hope the colors, are the same for you as they are for me. The orange has a single minimum and green has two minima, which are symmetric. And, and uh, blue is the uh, plot of the harmonic oscillator we discussed before. So uh, if the sign is such that uh, the potential has a single minimum at the origin, uh, then we can approximate the Hamiltonian by the harmonic oscillator Hamiltonian with certain effective frequency. And so we can solve this problem by perturbation theory and qualitatively it will have levels like harmonic oscillator, but the energies of those levels will depend slightly in a slightly different way on the uh, level number. Whereas if we do it for the double well potential, so the one which corresponds to the negative sign uh, under the square, we can approximate this Hamiltonian by two different harmonic oscillators, depending on where we expand, you know, the right minimum or the left minimum. And so in perturbation theory, we would see two identical spectra, at least for low outlying states. So one which corresponds to the states in the right hand side, right vacuum, and the other which corresponds to the states localized near the left vacuum and the minimum of the, of the potential. However, qualitative physics of the system is not that of two oscillators, but rather of a single oscillator. And so, as you can, of course, read in the newspapers or textbooks, it's due to the tunneling that there is a mixing of the wave functions or the states. So the states which uh, really solve the, uh, the stationary states, they're neither localized in the left nor in the right vacuum, but they actually are linear superposition of of the states which are localized at both. And uh, to do this computation uh, in a proper way, we need to find uh, 
as a, in the case of less later, we need to find subtle points in the path integral. And what we'll find is that there are actually many more subtle points, subtle trajectories. And they make a heavy use of the complex phase space. So let's proceed like we did before. So let's just you know, choose one sign for the potential. Again, we need to solve the uh, Hamilton equations with now this prefactor I beta for the evolution operator e to the minus beta h. And again, uh, the actual value of the classical energy uh, is constant on this trajectory. However, oh, from the lesson of harmonic oscillator, we know that this trajectory in general sits in the space of complex P and X. And so the, this energy E, it's a classical energy. It's not the energy of the actual state in the quantum mechanical system could be complex. And so we can ask what kind of surface does this equation actually describe? So if I plot in the space of P and X, the set of P and X such as P squared over two plus uh, lambda over four X squared minus S squared squared is constant, we will get uh, in the space of complex P and X, which is two complex dimensional or real four dimensional space, we'll get one complex dimensional curve or two real dimensional surface. And the mathematicians will tell you that this surface actually has a topology of a two dimensional torus. So it's a two dimensional surface inside the four dimensional space. And the trajectory, which is the solution of the Hamilton equations, uh, will be a kind of a winding path on that torus. Now, uh, by the winding path, I mean really uh, something which looks like a straight line. In the, uh, on the universal cover. So if you unfold the torus, make it look like a plane with some lattice identifications, uh, this binding will become just a straight line. Now, this straight line can wind this torus uh, in a kind of regular fashion or it can uh, wind ergodically. And generic torus windings are actually ergodic, so they feel densely. However, in computing things of interest for quantum mechanical problem, like the trace of the evolution operator or, or the traditional amplitudes, only the uh, rational, that is to say periodic or closed windings or the windings uh, which are not closed, but uh, could be closed if we continue, that, uh, continue to indefinitely. Uh, in other words, they have rational angle with respect to the uh, axis generators of the lattice, which uh, defines the torus, only such trajectories will give non-zero contributions. The other trajectories, the generic ergodic trajectories will have an infinite action and will not contribute. And now in case of the harmonic oscillator, the torus is the two-dimensional torus and a rational winding on this torus actually has two parameters two integer parameters, namely how many times this trajectory winds around one A cycle and how many times it winds around the B cycle. And so these trajectories and therefore the energy level uh, would be characterized by two integers. And so these two integers are, uh, if we go back to, the, uh, to this picture, roughly speaking corresponds to the number, correspond to the number of ways you can tunnel under the uh, classically uh, forbidden potential. That's one number, that's roughly M. And another number is how many times you fluctuate in the classically allowed region near the left and the right vacuum. If you think about it, the motion in the left vacuum and the motion in the right vacuum, uh, once you leave this into the complexified picture actually become homologous. So they represent the same cycle on the torus. So the summation over the saddle points in the space of paths, uh, that's a, uh, so that's in general, it's a complicated problem. And to some extent it is approximated by the, uh, the count of instantons, which we will, uh, discuss uh, later. Now, 
if a little bit more introduction uh, in quantum mechanical systems, uh, so we don't just deal with oscillators and the small perturbations, we also sometimes deal with symmetry with uh, theories with symmetries and having a symmetry, so some group G which uh, acts by let's say unity transformations of the Hilbert space of quantum mechanics and uh, commute. So these transformations commute with the Hamiltonian. Uh, in quantum mechanics, we have several options uh, if, if we have the symmetry group. So one is to treat the symmetry as a redundancy and to declare that the physical uh, Hilbert space is actually the space of invariance of the group action in this bigger Hilbert space. So we only keep the vectors which are invariant under the uh, symmetry transformations for any uh, element of the group of symmetry group. And because of the fact that the Hamiltonian commutes with the group action, uh, it will act, will preserve the space of physical states. And so we can consider the dynamics on the space of invariance. And this is, uh, so it's a quantum procedure which has a classical uh, analog, which we will encounter in several disguises today. One is the so-called symplectic quotient. So uh, the classical analog of the quantum mechanical system is a phase space, which is a, some manifold with the symplectic uh, form. So omega is a two form, which is closed. And having a symmetry group uh, means that uh, the Lie algebra of, the, uh, of this group is mapped uh, by a homomorphism. That is to say that the commutation relations are preserved into the space of all vector fields on this black on this black uh, manifold P, and uh, the uh, a way to ensure that this vector fields actually preserve the symplectic form is to insist on the existence of the so-called moment map, namely that the contraction of the vector field V with the symplectic form is exact. It's, it's an exact one form, which is the derivative of, um, of some function, which linearly depends on the element C of the Lie algebra. And so all such linear functions can be combined into a map, which is called the moment map, mu uh, from the uh, phase space to the space dual to the real algebra of the symmetry group. And so in this case, the uh, symplectic quotient is a new symplectic manifold with symplectic form, which is obtained by setting the moment map to zero. That is to say by taking the level set, zero level set of moment map and dividing it by the action of the group G. So that will produce uh, out of maybe simpler phase space P, it will produce something which may be quite complicated on which the dynamics of the original Hamiltonian system might look uh, quite non-trivial. So as an example, let's take a, a set of n-harmonic oscillators. So the phase space of this combined set of harmonic oscillators would be just a vector space R to the 2n. Uh, or complex space C to the N, which we can coordinate by the analogs of the ZZ star coordinates we used uh, previously with a single harmonic oscillator. Uh, now we have N of them. And uh, we can take as a Hamiltonian a sum of, sum of harmonic oscillator Hamiltonians for the individual uh, oscillators. And they may have different frequencies. So it's generic, kind of generic harmonic oscillator uh, Hamiltonian. Now, uh, there is a symmetry which is manifest in the Z presentation. I mean, I could have written it in the PQ presentation. It would have been slightly more involved. But in the Z presentation, it's just the phase rotation of all the eyes simultaneously. And Z stars are rotated in the opposite direction. So you can compute the moment map which generates a symmetry, it will be the simple uh, sum of Z absolute value squared. And uh, the, this equation, which I used to define the moment map, does not actually define mu uniquely. It, 
you can add a constant to it for the non abelian groups uh, or the algebras. The choice of this constant is restricted because we want the Poisson brackets of mu to be the same relations as the real algebra. But for an abelian commutative G's, uh, these constants can be chosen arbitrarily. So the small map is defined up to this constant. So let me introduce it. So then the quotient, the redu reduced phase space, will actually be quite an interesting space, complex projective space, CPN minus one which is the space of uh, solutions of the equation on the Z, uh, Z coordinates. So this equation defines for you uh, uh, two N minus one dimensional sphere. And then we, we quotient the sphere by the action of the symmetry group U1 and the result is this uh, uh, space. The, the symplectic structure, the symplectic quotient actually doesn't know that the resulting space is complex space. It uh, only views it as a symplectic manifold, which is what you need for the Hamiltonian dynamics, but it just happens that it also is complex, complex uh, space and it's a quite, quite an important one in the algebraic, in algebraic geometry. Now, instead of the, taking the quotient or, or imposing the invariance, the condition having the symmetry group Again, in quantum mechanics, we can use it as a way of classifying the types of uh, states according to the symmetries, the way they transform. So we can decompose the Hilbert space of the quantum mechanical system with the symmetry group G into the irreducible representations of, of the symmetry group G. Um, and then the multiplicities, so these are some vector spaces, uh, which tell you how many times the given Urep R occurs in the Hilbert space. So the Hamiltonian being an operator which commutes to the action of G reduces to an operator acting within each multiplicity space. And so the original quantum mechanical problem reduces to a bunch of smaller quantum mechanical problems uh, on each of them irreducible component. So the example of that uh, consideration for the, let's say for N identical harmonic oscillators, uh, the Hilbert space is a tensor product of the Hilbert spaces we, we had before. So now they are labeled by the collection of N capital integers, N1 and N, each of them is negative. And now if we perform the reduction, the um, respect to U1 symmetry, that means imposing the constraint that the sum of this number is equal to R. And the reduced system will have a symmetry SUN. So it's a remainder of the bigger symmetry group which acted on this full Hilbert space, which is generated by the operators which can be built out of the creation and annihilation operators in, the, in this way. So it's a product of I, I annihilation operator and J creation operator up to some constant. Uh, so we have N squared such uh, operators, but because of this constraint, uh, we have N squared minus one independent operators because the way it's designed, the sum of J hat is equal to zero. So the resulting space is actually finite dimensional and it's an irreducible irreducible representation of the group SUN. So it's a, it's a special case of this decomposition when you have only one R appearing and here the multiplicity space is actually one dimensional. And uh, this space is a space of symmetric uh, tensors uh, of rank R with N indices, with N uh, uh, on N dimensional space. And it's usually described by the Young diagram which is the single row with R boxes. Now, uh, the Hamiltonian of the uh, harmonic oscillators, so this sum of harmonic oscillators with different frequencies, uh, so they're identical in nature, but they're not identical as uh, in frequency. So that Hamiltonian has some spectrum, which we can compute uh, and it is convenient to 
repackage this spectrum uh, in the generative function, which is the trace of exponential minus beta in this Hamiltonian. And uh, well, it's not difficult to compute it because we know the spectrum of this Hamiltonian on the full space of, um, or on the full Hilbert space of unharmonic oscillators. So we just need to select out of this full Hilbert space, the states which uh, obey the projection condition that the sum of the uh, occupation numbers in one to NN is equal to the fixed number, number R. And so uh, it's an elementary calculation that the selection rule is equivalent to taking the coefficient of the auxiliary variable T uh, the power R in the expansion of the uh, partition function of the unrestricted harmonic oscillators. So this first formula is just is basically uh, it's an elementary translation of this projection condition. But then you can compute this coefficient by residue and then by slight manipulation of the residue uh, of the counter integral computing the residue, you will rewrite the same formula as a sum of n terms. And these terms have an interesting structure with the numerator and denominator. And in fact, it's a formula which uh, can be sort of guessed by looking at the geometry of, the, of this classical phase space, which is corresponds to the uh, collection of and harmonic oscillators with this projection. So uh, this n terms, n terms in this formula correspond to n fixed points of the uh, action of the maximal torus of the group SUN on this projective space. And uh, I don't want to spend too much time on it. Uh, I just want to point out two things that this formula has an interesting dependence on the parameter R. In particular, it gives you something non-trivial even for R negative. Although, even though the left-hand side the original formula only made sense for R uh, non-negative because uh, if your numbers and one to, to and n are non-negative and you want to select those which sum up to R, you get non something non-empty only for R uh, greater than or equal to zero. Nevertheless, the right-hand side admits, yes, there is a question. Uh, yes. Uh, in the formula coefficient TR. Yes. Oops. Uh, yeah. In the right hand side of this formula, where, where do you have R? Because I see so, in the line, I see that. Uh, so you have, have R, R here in the fixed point formula, it's an exponent. Exactly. And, the, and above, where's the and right above side? it's the coefficient of, of T to the R in the expansion of this, of the, of, of this product. I see. So, so this product can be expanded, I mean, just using just geometric series formula in the variable T. Yeah, I get it. So it will give us precisely the sum over non-negative numbers N1, N2, and capital N. And we just want to extract from this uh, geometric series only the terms with the power of this green variable T equal to the R. So this is what this uh, notation means. But okay. this is a sort of character of some representation what you have in the left hand side. Yes, it's actually, so this, what I call the Hamiltonian H hat of R is actually, uh, you can view it as a, as a generic linear combination of the Cartan generators of the group SUN which acts in the, in the space of physical states. And so this trace, like a thermal trace, can also be interpreted as a character of the representation of SUN. And then the fact that it has this fixed point formula is familiar from the uh, vial formula of the, the, from the presentation. Thank you. But what I wanted to point out is that uh, it actually gives something non-zero even for R negative. I mean, the, the last formula is, makes sense for R negative. And, um, it, 
And so it's something to, you know, to reflect on. So it's one of these passive studies of nature when you get some formula and then the formula suddenly sort of tells you something which you didn't put in in, in the beginning. And um, so I, I will not answer, I will not explain what it is, but just something to ponder about. It's a prototype of many of the formulas we'll see later. So the, uh, the more complicated story we will we'll, uh, deal with later is built on a bunch of formulas like that. So another example of the reduction which we can get from uh, oscillators uh, is kind of dual in a certain sense. Uh, maybe you heard words like causal duality in, in recent years. So it's a kind of a boson fermion duality. And so if instead of the bosonic oscillators for which the commutation relations use commutators, we can deal with fermionic oscillators for which the commutation relations involve anti-commutators. And um, so you, if you just act, ask what kind of space of states such oscillators can generate, they generate actually now only a finite dimensional uh, space of states because the square of each of these operators is equal to zero, unlike the bosonic oscillators, which can be raised uh, to any power. Now uh, we have, we still have a, a UN symmetry, which is generated by the quadratic expressions built out of the fermionic oscillators. So they form the similar algebra, the algebra formed by the bilinears on the bosonic oscillators. Um, and we can also gauge the UN symmetry generated by the, let's say, by the center of the UN and get the reduced system, which will be uh, an irreducible representation of SUN. This time will be the space of anti-symmetric tensors of rank R with N uh, in N dimensional vector space, which is described by the Young diagram, which is the um, column of the length R. And the fermionic and uh, the character of, so the character of, uh, of thermal partition function of uh, the reduced system in this case, well, I only know of the one formula, which is the coefficient of T to the R in the expansion of the product now with the numerator as opposed to the denominator. I don't have uh, I don't have a uh, fixed point formula. So the quantization of fermions doesn't have uh, useful classical uh, analog. And so the geometry underlying the fermions is, is more subtle in some sense. But what we will have later will be a combination of uh, the uh, Sorry, uh, some, okay, there was some discussion. Okay, so uh, in what follows, we will be combining bosonic and fermionic oscillators and uh, uh, add interactions and uh, get something non trivial. So the simplest way to combine them is. Uh, it's called supersymmetric quantum, super -symmetric quantum mechanics, uh, which we will uh, encounter a little bit later. But the point is that, so after these uh, preparations, which are, I apologize if they were too trivial, but they illustrated the several important aspects of, of, of this general story, we can try to generalize the system with infinite number of degrees of freedom. And that's called quantum field theory. Uh, let's start with classical, classical theory. And the classical theory we will start with will be the theory of electromagnetism. So uh, Maxwell equations, which describe the classical electric and magnetic phenomena, and they can combine phenomena, uh, can be formulated uh, mathematically using the uh, anti-symmetric uh, rank to tensor uh, field. So it's uh, it's a tensor whose components depend on the coordinates on space-time. 
And the equations read uh, that the two form F is closed and it's uh, Hodge dual uh, is also closed. So um, what I want to discuss now is the, the, so I want to give the treatment of these equations analogous to what we discussed before. So what I, my point is, which I will try to make is that it's a kind of an infinite collection of uh, harmonic oscillators uh, to which we, so we will see that the notions which we discussed before uh, actually uh, all, all show up and play a role in, 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 the, in, this, in the construction of electromagnetism. So uh, we can formulate electromagnetism in the Hamiltonian formalism. So in this, in this approach, we'll split, we temporarily forget about the relativistic invariance, uh, Lorentz invariance, uh, Poincaré invariance, so on and so forth. We just split the space-time as a product of space R3 and time R. And we'll try to formulate things on, on the space slice. So uh, the coordinates of electromagnetism in the first approximation are just the three temporal, uh, three spatial components of a vector potential. And the momenta are the three uh, components of electric field. So that they are uh, canonically conjugate. But uh, it's not quite that. Uh, this is a system with a gauge symmetry. So it's a symmetry which is actually re redundancy. So the physical states are uh, quotient of the space of uh, all vector potentials and electric fields subject to the moment map equation. So the moment map for the uh, electromagnetism is called Gauss law and it's a divergence of the electric field. So the actual phase space of the uh, electromagnetism is the space of pairs uh, E and A. Uh, you can, or when we work on R3, you can think of them as vectors, not as forms. Uh, so we subject the uh, electric vector field uh, to, the, to the divergence free constraint. So that's the moment map equation. And then the quotient with respect to the symmetry, which this moment map generates, and that's, these are the usual gradient or gauge transformations. So here I'm, I'm being sloppy because uh, things are defined on R3 and uh, R3 is non-compact and we need to, to be careful about how things decay at infinity. So believe it or not, this is a story which even today is not completely settled. So people keep uh, imposing various boundary conditions and treat some of this as actually as global symmetries, not as, not as redundancies and get different theories as a result. So we will avoid worrying about this by the tensor F, which I feel is just there. Uh, uh, sorry. And I... Oops, something happened. Hello? Are you okay? Yeah. Can you hear me? I think, yes, I think now it's, it's fine. We recover again. Maybe you can explain a little okay. bit what you say. Okay, I was, uh, okay, so I was, okay, so let me go back. So I wrote the Maxwell, Maxwell equations in a coordinate-free fashion. I mean, I didn't want to repeat Maxwell equations from the textbook uh, because they're in the textbook. Uh, but then I wanted to describe them, uh, the same equations I want to describe as Hamilton equations for, uh, for certain symplectic manifold. 
and that symplectic manifold, it's infinite dimensional manifold, which is the quotient, symplectic quotient, akin to the symplectic quotient we had for the story of harmonic oscillators, but this time with respect to the group of gauge transformations. And the relation of this formalism to the previous formalism is that the electric fields are the components of the field strength with one in this, this is one of the indices being time. And the vector potential is uh, how you solve for, you can solve for the vector potential from the space components of, of the field strength, which is also known as magnetic field. Uh, now, there's a slight modification which is possible, uh, which can be also, again, motivated by, by finite dimensional classical mechanical systems, where the, you actually slightly change the notion of the momentum for the uh, momentum for the vector potential. So instead of E, I will call it pi, and this pi is not exactly the electric field, but it's, it's electric field plus theta times magnetic field, where theta is a new parameter. Now, on when we work on R3 and we don't care much about the boundary conditions, neither the, the parameter G squared, which is what multiplies the electric and divides the magnetic contributions to the Hamiltonian, nor this parameter theta are really you know, physical. So they can be changed by canonical, canonical transformations with the, uh, um, which are generated by, by the Hamiltonians uh, P dot A or B dot A. But uh, if we replace R3 by compact three manifold, or we work in the quantum theory, or we add matter, then these parameters become physical. And so we have different theories for different coupling constant G and different uh, theta angles theta. So uh, I want to talk about global issues in Maxwell theory. And so we will now work on the compact three manifold instead of the space R3. So now uh, our phase space variables are a gauge field on M3. So it's a local, it's one form, but not so globally. And the conjugate variable pi is a two form. So being a connection one form means that its derivative f, which is dA, actually doesn't have to be exact. Namely, uh, the only requirement is that for any non-contractible two cycle sigma inside your three manifold M, the period of this uh, curvature to form f uh, should be uh, two pi times an integer. It's a physics normalization. In mathematical normalization, A is actually purely imaginary. So the period of F would be two pi I times an integer. And um, similarly, the electric field pi, uh, it's a two form on M3. Uh, and Gauss law says it's, it's a closed two form. Now, a priori could have have, uh, could have had any uh, homology side, uh, class. So it could be, it could represent some homology class in second homology of M3. But uh, quantization will actually ensure that it's a, a integer class up to two pi factor. So again, for any two cycle sigma, the period of the integral of this uh, pi uh, two form over the cycle should be essentially an integer times two pi. But that only shows up upon quantization. Classically, it's in any real number. So the Hamiltonian of Maxwell theory in this slightly more sophisticated setup when the manifold space manifold is a compact manifold M3 can be written as a sum of two terms. So one is the electric term and the second is magnetic term. And so we see that now G and theta are the two parameters. And in fact, the eigenvalues of this Hamiltonian depend on G and theta in the trivial. So now to proceed, I need a little bit of, uh, go, I need to go back a little bit 
And to remind you, um, an example of a quantum mechanical system which combines the bosonic and fermionic oscillators. And it's a uh, fun way to do this is to glue, somehow patch together local systems of uh, bosonic and fermionic oscillators defined for a Riemann manifold X of some dimension Z. So uh, we start with a, it's a version of Heisenberg and Clifford algebras. Uh, it's not a minimal choice, but it's a fun one. And uh, you can um, play a little bit with these algebras to find out what's required, how to transform the generators of these algebras uh, according to the nonlinear coordinate changes, which we normally do uh, when we glue a manifold out of pieces of uh, Euclidean spaces. So you will find that the generators of the Clifford algebra can be simply linearly transformed uh, using the uh, Jacobi matrix of the uh, transformation of coordinates. So for them, nothing really complicated happens. You just linearly change psi and, and chi. But uh, in order for these generators uh, commute properly with the momentum, which is conjugate to the uh, coordinates, actually the momenta transform in a highly non-trivial way. So they try to actually transform as connections rather than, rather than as one forms, as we normally think about momenta. Anyway, so you can combine these uh, oscillators and uh, form the generators of a new type of algebra, symmetry algebra called supersymmetry. And so you have the generators Q and Q star. And Q star will actually use the metric. So that's why it's a Riemannian manifold. And the anti-commutator will be the simplest Hamiltonian for the quantum mechanics on the Riemannian manifold, which is actually a Laplacian. But Laplacian acting on um, um, differential forms. So the way to represent this algebra, yes, the question. Yes. Yes. Uh, how would you get the, the this algebra, this super symmetric algebra? So I just defined it. So I said I said that I start with the uh, simplest uh, algebra of uh, uh, bosonic and uh, fermionic oscillators, and then I so with this algebra I can define the operators Q and Q star. Uh, what's non-trivial, and that's so I sketch this with this formula with these formulas without indices, that this these definitions actually make sense uh, on a curved nonlinear manifold. So if you may perform these uh, changes of uh, coordinates, these generators remain intact. Um, that was the idea, right? That's the, that's the idea, yes. And then you can ask what type of geometric objects uh, these guys define. So uh, they define, so the Hilbert space in which this will be realized will be the differential forms, omega omega bullet uh, of X. So the operators, uh, this local operators P and Psi would be essentially the operation multiplications of by the differentials of the coordinates and essentially derivatives with respect to coordinates. And then the operators Q and Q star would be the Dram, the exterior derivative, and it's dual defined using the metric of first star. And so the supersymmetry algebra would be the, the familiar algebra of Dram operators. So D squared equals to zero, D star squared equals to zero, and the usual definition of Laplacian as the anti-commutator of D and D star. In addition to, uh, so this supersymmetry algebra has uh, two bosonic generators and two fermionic generators. In addition to the Hamiltonian H, which is a Laplacian, it also has the U1 symmetry, which is generated by the product of pi and psi. And so in the differential geometric setting or words, the uh, Hilbert space is the space of differential forms, which we can decompose as we did before 
with respect to the symmetry, the symmetry being U1. And so the uh, sub representations, so U1 representations uh, would be the differential forms of given degree. So this would be degrading by the form degree. Now for compact, if the manifold X is compact, we have a bonus, which we will use later. And that's the Hodge decomposition. It's not the Hodge decomposition of the algebraic geometry, it's the Hodge decomposition of the differential geometry, uh, where any differential form can be represented. I mean, the space of differential forms of a given degree P has an orthogonal decomposition as a sum of uh, forms which are annihilated by both D and D star, and therefore by the Laplacian, therefore by the Hamiltonian. They de uh, the exact forms and co-exact forms. So exact forms are the image of D acting on forms of degree P minus one, and co-exact forms are the image of D star acting on forms of degree P plus one. And so the harmonic forms are the vacua of this uh, Hamiltonian, and they are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the cohomology of the manifold. And the exact and co-exact forms are, they have strictly positive eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian or Laplacian, so they correspond to the so-called excited states. So now with this preparation, we can apply this to the composition to a three manifold M. And so we will actually need more specifically the uh, Laplacian eigenbasis of Laplacian acting on uh, a co-exact one forms. So these are one forms, which are the star of some two forms. And so we can uh, decompose them into the eigenspaces of the Laplacian. Now, uh, so these one forms, which are in the image of D star, they are therefore killed by D star. And so the Laplacian acts on them simply by D star D. The second piece D D star just vanishes. And so we want them to be eigenfunctions of the Laplacian. So there could be several of those, depending on the shape of your manifold M3, the spectrum may have, of Laplacian may have multiplicities. Uh, what we know uh, for sure, is that the spectrum has multiplicity of two at least. And that's because uh, the space of two such forms carries two uh, metrics. One is positive definite, which is defined by the integral over M3 with the star, Hodge star. And the second one is uh, semi-definite. In fact, it's not positive definite. And it's defined using the integral with the insertion of the exterior derivative. And the combination of these two uh, bilinear forms actually give you a complex structure. Uh, so the complex structure is given by the operator star D divided by the square root of Laplacian, essentially. And so it's squares to minus one. And that's why. Okay. Uh, yes? Sorry, can I ask something in like two slides before? Three. Not the previous one. Okay. So here you are defining quantum mechanics, right? So you are working like locally on the tang in the tangent space. Uh, it's a quantum. So this was just the interlude. So I've just said that one can study uh, quantum mechanics, supersymmetric quantum mechanics of a particle moving on a Riemannian manifold XD. Uh, but it's a particle with some internal degrees of freedom, which are represented by the fermionic uh, oscillators psi and chi. And the space of states of that quantum mechanics would be the space of differential forms on the manifold XD. Uh, so that was just the. Uh, so, so my question is if you want to generalize to QFT, which structure you have to change? Like, I think you have to instead of working in the tangent space, maybe to the bundle, tangent bundle, or? No, no, it's, it's, there's no tangent space here. So it's a quantum mechanics on the manifold. So the, uh, uh, if you like, okay, the fermionic oscillators, psi and chi, so psi lives on a tangent space to, to a point 
uh, of X, chi roughly speaks lives on the cotangent space. Uh, so, and so, so it's a structure which is built around the uh, geometry of the manifold X. But quantum field theory uses this those ingredients. I'm just saying, I, I, I had this preparatory discussion because I'm using some piece of the knowledge about this quantum mechanics in the analysis of quantum field theory. So quantum field theory has infinitely many such quantum mechanics in, inside. Is it maybe? Yeah, yeah, just to, to, to make sense of the physics with the math that you are implying, but it's okay. Maybe later on, I will get it. Uh, well, um, okay, maybe what's familiar is, so in quantum field theory, we do the second quantization. So if you like, the, uh, these differential forms which we use in describing Maxwell theory. So the forms themselves, they are like wave functions for some auxiliary quantum mechanics, supersymmetric quantum mechanics on the three manifold on which the quantum field theory will be living. But then we do maybe a, a second quantum mechanics with infinite dimensional phase space so the phase space which I'm describing using, so I'm just see, I'm describing the classical phase space of Maxwell theory. It's a classical field theory, but this classical phase space of Maxwell theory is defined in terms of the Hilbert space of a quantum mechanical system, for which the target space is M three. See, so field theory lives on M3 cross time. Uh, for us, M3 cross time is our space time. But for the, imagine that there is a, you have a kind of auxiliary quantum mechanical system, which is probing the space time. And so the target space of this classical, of this auxiliary quantum mechanical system is M3. And this fact is a supersymmetric quantum mechanical system because the states of the quantum mechanics would be not just functions on M3, but differential forms on M3, specifically one forms. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the fact that we're actually dealing with, not with one forms, but with, with connections plays a role, but uh, right now I want to discuss the uh, kind of non-zero modes, and for them, they can be treated as, as just connection, as just one forms. We don't need to know about them being connections. Yes, there was a question from one of the ones. Yes. So this is a description of uh, QFT and M3, right? It's correct. Say, say it again, description of what? So this is a description of QFT and M3. It's a QFT on M3 cross, it's a, no, it's not QFT yet. It's a classical field theory on M3 cross time. I'm, I'm trying to describe classical Maxwell theory, but you see, it's a Maxwell Hamiltonian, it's a classical Maxwell Hamiltonian for the moment. Classical, not quantum. I just want to describe its phase space in, uh, in some detail. So I want to describe the space of A's modular transformations, this space of P's, which solve the Gauss law. I just want to somehow get a handle on that space. In textbooks, what you usually read is some kind of plane wave decomposition. I just want to do that in a more geometric way. Is it clear? Yeah. I want to I want to describe what is the plane, what are the uh, what is a photon and what are the helicities of the photon in a geometric way. If you let me. <laughs> so uh, so what I'm trying to explain is that so Maxwell theory is a bunch of harmonic oscillators. They are labeled by the eigenspaces of, of the Laplacian, 
of the Hodge Dirham Laplacian uh, acting on one forms, which are co closed. And that space, I claim, has a complex structure. And so the elicited decomposition of the, I mean, the two degrees of freedom of the photon, which you normally read about in textbooks, have to do with the, uh, the space of eigenfunctions of Laplacian having complex structures. So you can think about, talk about holomorphic and anti-holomorphic coordinates on that space. So they would correspond to the helicity plus or helicity minus states. Uh, now, so we can now we can decompose our fields and, and sort of make it more um, tri trivialize this problem. So if I have the two form pi, which obeys uh, the Gauss law, we can use the Hodge decomposition to write it as a sum of a harmonic two form, which I call pi sub h, and uh, an exact two form. So its exact form is D over one form. And so we can decompose those in the basis which we prepare. Uh, so var pi lambda a are just some basis vectors in the space. Uh, so var pi's are one forms. We need two forms, so we apply D to get one forms. And so the parameters are the coefficients of this composition, which are which I call p sub lambda comma a. So lambda labels the eigenvalues of Laplacian, and a labels the multiplicity. Similarly, we can decompose the magnetic field, so the curvature of the gauge field. Uh, so it, again, it has a harmonic part f sub h, and then it has the exact part. And so the exact part would have the identical decomposition, but with different coefficients, which I call Q. Now, if I know DA, it will not determine A uniquely, even up to gauge summations, because uh, there could be a piece of A which is harmonic in itself. So it's a harmonic, there's a harmonic one form piece of A. Which is, which is killed by D. So I will not see it in decomposition of the curvature F. Uh, but there are gauge transformations um, here, which are generated by phi, which in, on a compact manifold M3 doesn't have to be a single valued function. What should be single valued is a map e to the i phi uh, from M3 to a circle to U1. And so it means that you can shift A by, by one form, which is not necessarily exact, but it's closed and its periods are in two phi integers. And so that means that this harmonic piece of A sub H is defined up to a shift by an element of H1 of M3 in two pi Z. So bottom line is that uh, we have two cohomology classes, uh, pi sub h and f sub h. One is an element of the lattice to, from the get-go. It's a magnetic flux, flux. We also have the harmonic one form a sub h, which is real, but it's defined up to an integer. And then we have the infinite set of coordinates and momenta for the excited states or the uh, non-trivial uh, eigenvectors of the Laplacian. So when you substitute all that into the formula for the symplectic form, you will see that finally that the phase space of maximal theory on the compact three manifold M3 uh, factorizes into a product of a finite dimensional space P sub fluxes, and then an infinite set of vector spaces infinite sum of vector spaces, which are the cotangent bundles to the spaces of uh, co-exact one forms, which are eigenfunctions, eigenstates, uh, which are eigenforms of the Laplacian. So um, this bilinear symmetric form H, which I defined earlier, which uses some kind of a chance, uh, sorry, some kind of chance Simon's pairing 
shows up in the formula of a symplectic form. Now, this fine dimensional piece, piece of fluxus, is essentially it's a cotangent bundle to a torus. It's a torus built on the topology of M3. So it's a second, it's a first cohomology of M3 valued in the circle group. But you also take an infinite number of copies of that uh, kind of cotangent bundle to the torus, like a cylinder, uh, in the amount of the lattice of second cohomology of M3 varied with the integers. So now we can quantize. So the, the Hamiltonian is a kind of quadratic function on the infinite dimensional space. The Hamiltonian depends on the coupling constant G on the theta angle theta on this metric GAB and on the eigenvalues of Laplacian, which depend on the metric. And uh, so that's on the excited states. So it's a, like, a, as promised, it's a bunch of harmonic oscillators, but the frequencies know about the geometry of the manifold M3. And there is a finite dimensional piece, H0, which essentially operates on the cohomology groups. So when I quantize, P sub H becomes the derivative with respect to A sub H, and A sub H is a kind of linear coordinate on, on this uh, cohomology group. So when you quantize it, um, P sub H becomes an integer, which is the uh, electric flux I had talked about earlier. And so H sub zero becomes really just a quadratic function on, on a doubled lattice. So the first component of the lattice is H2 of M3, value to integers. And the second component of the lattice is essentially H lower one of M3 value to the integers. And so the, uh, the Hilbert space of Maxwell theory, now quantum Maxwell theory uh, is a tensor product of a Hilbert space built on fluxes and this Hilbert space built, built on photons. And so the flux part, as a basis labeled by uh, by a lattice of the size twice the beta number, second beta number equal to the first beta number of the manifold M3. So the first lattice M, uh, as I said many times now, it, it, it has a topological origin and it's, it's a lattice already for classical Maxwell theory. The second lattice emerges upon quantization. In classical Maxwell theory, uh, the electric fields uh, take continuous values. Now, the photons uh, produce a bunch of Fox spaces of harmonic oscillators. For each pair, for each index lambda and A, we have a single harmonic oscillator Fox space. So, these are the usual uh, creation and annihilation operators for the uh, photons. Now, the bottom line, so the message from, from all the discussion is that uh, upon quantization, Maxwell theory acquires a certain symmetry, which is the kind of a symmetry of description, namely uh, what we call electric and what we call magnetic actually depends on the point of view. Uh, in, so in the frame in which we started, we have, uh, so the states are labeled by electric and magnetic charges. So the, again, magnetic charges are elements of the second cohomology group of M3 value to the integers. And uh, there are operators which change, which take us from one sector to another sector. It's easy to write an operator which will change the electric charge. And this operator involves the uh, holonomies of the gauge field along non-contractible loops. So the loops topologically are just elements of the first homology group, H1, the lower one of the three value to the integers. Uh, however, the operator which Maxwell theory assigns to this homology class is slightly tricky. 
because you need to find actually a representative of this homology class by geodesic minimal length uh, trajectory on M3. And that might be tricky. Uh, so then you can actually multiply by an integer. You can take a geodesic, which is multiply one and compute the integral of the gauge field. Yes, question. Yeah, why it could be tricky? Um, well, imagine you have a, uh, well, I mean, the manifold M3 could be very complicated. You could have fundamental group, which is, uh, you know, has many generators, uh, many relations. Uh, uh, it's good for, for, the, for, for, for Taurus, it's easy, but <laughs> for some, uh, you know, the, the problem of classification of three manifolds is, is one of the wild problems because of the fundamental group, which could be quite complicated. Um, what I mean maybe is that it's, I don't know, in these days people talk a lot about topological theories, which do not depend on the metric. Uh, like Chan Simon's theory. And so there we usually, we don't care about the actual representative of a loop. So you take any loop and you can define the Wilson loop observable. But in Maxwell, already in Maxwell theory, if you think about it, if you just take any, if you take a random representative of, a, uh, of an element of homology group, not a, not a fundamental group, just homology group, uh, and just, you know, try, use an extremely wiggly representative with many wiggles, which uh, play no role in homology, uh, that operator will actually produce excitations in Maxwell theory. So if I only want to have an operator which acts between ground states in different flux sectors, then, then this uh, loop which, which I'm using should be, which should have a minimal number of wiggles possible given the homology. Plus. So it's just a little subtlety. So then if you use that representative, then uh, the Wilson loop uh, applied to the state gamma with the uh, magnetic and electric labels MN will produce another state gamma with the same magnetic label, but different, uh, but the electric label shifted by Q times the homology plus C. Now the point gray duality implies that the largest subelectric and magnetic fluxes are isomorphic. And uh, just like the, uh, the usual algebra of oscillators, which admits automorphisms, which relates, uh, which maps coordinate momenta into a linear combination of coordinate momenta uh, with coefficients, uh, real coefficients A, B, C, D such that A, D minus B, C is equal to one to preserve the canonical commutation relation. We can do the similar transformations on flux labels. The invertibility of this transformation uh, will require that A, D minus B, C equals to one. And, uh, but the fact that the flux, fluxes are, are quantized, they, they, they belong to a lattice, restricts the choice of parameters A, B, C, and D. They, they should be an integer, not, no, not uh, arbitrary real numbers. However, uh, of course, just like for oscillator, you start with a harmonic oscillator with Hamiltonian P squared plus Q squared and apply this automorphism of the Heisenberg algebra, you will produce Another Hamiltonian it will not be this, the, the old uh, harmonic oscillator. Uh, similarly, for Maxwell theory, if you make a similar, similar substitution with fluxes and all excited states, uh, the Hamiltonian will not be invariant, but it will correspond to new choice of uh, gauge coupling G and theta angle theta. So they will exhibit a, a PSL to Z transformation of that form. And that's important for, uh, for the next story. 
Okay, so, so far we've been discussing Maxwell theory, which is, even though it's a little bit subtle, it's still a free field theory. So it just describes non-interacting particles. Um, the, so we would like to discuss the unharmonic oscillator analog of Maxwell theory. And that's uh, in some sense, the simplest unharmonic analog of Maxwell theory is the young Mills theory where we replace the uh, abelian gauge group U1, which we had before by a general Lie group G. And uh, in my story, we will be dealing with the general unitary groups UN. So uh, as before the, uh, so now I'm, I will abandon, I will abandon the Hamiltonian formalism and I will work in Lagrangian formalism, namely I will, work in space time as opposed to space across time. So the uh, space time Lagrangian for young Mills theory uh, in the most compact form is the sum of two terms, the young proper young Mills action, which is trace F wedge star F. And that has a coupling constant G squared in front of it. And there is a topological term, trace of F wedge F. It's topological in the sense that it does not require a choice of a metric on space time, uh, but it requires a choice of orientation. So, uh, and the condition of that is theta. So, this theta is uh, defined up to a two pi integer in quantum theory because exponential of this action will be, um, if you shift theta by an integer, it will not change because integral of trace f wedge f is an integer up to two pi squared factors. So the question which physicists are interested in are, is the following, that if I start with quantum field, if I define quantum field theory based on the classical Lagrangian with young Mills fields in it, what would be the effective theory? What would be the theory which we will uh, see at low energies? Um, the reason why we, we ask this question is that uh, we don't have massless, uh, young, we don't see massless uh, non-abelian gauge fields in, in nature, but we do believe that non-abelian gauge fields are responsible for, for strong and weak interactions. And so there is some kind of transition taking place from the microscopic theory of non-abelian gauge fields to the effective field theory where, where uh, we, don't, we don't have those degrees of freedom. So to, to you know, attack this question directly in four dimensions so far proved difficult. Uh, one piece of uh, knowledge has been found in thinking about the three-dimensional theory, which can be obtained by dimensional reduction from, of young Mills theory from four dimensions to three dimensions. So if you do the dimensional reduction, the gauge field becomes uh, two things. It becomes a ga gauge field and an adjoint valued scalar field, which sometimes is called the adjoint Higgs field phi. So the young Mills action, which I had previously, if you compute it for the field configurations which are independent of, on, on, uh, of the fourth uh, coordinate, will translate to a sum of the young Mills action in three dimensions and uh, kind of a Higgs uh, kinetic term for the Higgs field, which is the covariant derivative of phi uh, squared. Now, this is a little bit of phenomenology. You can add some. Now the gauge invariance actually allows for a potential term for this Higgs field phi. And so one can add this potential term to force uh, this field to condense. So to, to acquire non-zero expectation value infinity. And so then you can uh, expect that the dynamics of the, uh, of, the, of the theory would be that of the gauge theory uh, valued in the, with gauge fields valued in the maximal torus of the group G 
this maximum torus T will be singled out by the choice of the vacuum expectation value of the Higgs field. So you can decompose the, uh, the field phi and the gauge field A into the uh, sum of little a and then uh, W. So W will be taking values in the orthogonal complement to the maximal torus of the torus T in the Lie group. And similarly for the Higgs field. And so W on A, capital H will be massive fields. The masses will be determined by the expectation free value of little phi. And massive, massive fields at low energies will decouple. So you would get some kind of effective abelian uh, gauge theory. However, um, one can show that there is some, this theory somehow re retains a little bit of memory of the if, of its microscopic abelian uh, nature. And that's, uh, so this non-abelian nature translates to the existence of non-trivial subtle points of the, in the path integral for the original non-abelian theory. And these are the solutions of the so-called Bogomolny equations, which uh, are the uh, three-dimensional configurations of fields A and phi, which have finite action. These are called hoof polycov monopoles. And at large distances, these monopoles look like abelian monopoles. So it's something, uh, something like what happens with, with Maxwell theory on, on manifolds M3 of non-trivial topology. Except that here, you don't require this non-trivial topology. These solutions exist on R3. Uh, so somehow uh, the non-abelian theory at low energies looks like Maxwell theory on a kind of a bubbling space uh, where the non-contractible two spheres appear and disappear. And so the effect of this bubbling two spheres can be summarized by some kind of a uh, potential, which is written, which has a local expression in terms of a variable which is related to the gauge field A via a non-local change of variables. So in three dimensions, uh, if A is one form, D is a two form, Hodge dual of DA is again one form. And uh, under the path integral locally, this is, so this is closed. And so locally you can find the scalar for which this is exact. And so it's in terms of the scalar A sub two, A sub D, uh, the effect of this magnetic monopoles is actually a potential term, like a cosine of AD. And what's important, uh, I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not explaining this story in, in any detail, it's just, I'm just saying it's, you know, as a warm up for what follows, that the effect of this, uh, generated potential is to make this dual photon field, scalar field A, A sub D massive. And uh, that leads to the confinement of electric charges, which is revealed in the property that the expectation value of the Wilson loop observable exponential of integral over the loop C of A scales now with the area of surf of a surface, like a minimal area of a surface whose boundary is this loop C. So this is of course now on R3. Uh, so we only talk about loops which are contractible, which are boundaries of something. And so I'm neglecting all kinds of subtleties, which uh, we were much more careful about earlier with Maxwell theory on top of manifold M3. Okay, so this is just a warm up. So this is something which uh, Polikov understood in, in the seventies and people try to do something similar in four dimensions with Maxwell, with Young's uh, fields. Um, and so the dream was to do some exact computation in, in four dimensions with non abelian interacting uh, gauge theory. So it turns out that it's something like that can be done, but uh, not in the simplest theory, but rather in a theory which has many more fields. And that's a supersymmetric, supersymmetric angular theory, which can be viewed as the 
Young's theory on a more sophisticated space time. It's a, it's a space time whose coordinate functions obey not only the usual commutational relations that they just commute, like the ordinary coordinates, uh, but in addition, you have coordinates which anti commute, so they form Grassmann algebra. And so, the, uh, because that Grassmann algebra uh, is finite dimensional, it means that these additional dimensions of space time represented by those odd uh, or fermionic variables are very thin. You cannot go into those directions. You, the, these variables cannot have expectation value. They, can, they cannot have value one or something because uh, they square to, to zero. Nevertheless, this weird structure uh, proves very useful because uh, if you think about the, the field on this extended space time, you can expand it in a finite and convergent power series uh, in the grasp of variables. And the coefficients of expansion would be ordinary looking fields on, on, on our ordinary four dimensional space time with coordinates x, but somehow they will be combined in the unified, unified uh, package. And that's a supersymmetric uh, approach. So, with supersymmetry, we treat on equal footing scalars and fermions uh, and gauge fields. And so, we will be dealing. Uh, with a minimal supersymmetric and mills theory with n equals two supersymmetry. So it's a minimal theory, but not minimal supersymmetry. And so in that theory, the fields are uh, the gauge field and the complex adjoint scalar phi. So there is a conjugate phi bar. And we have fermion, fermions, which are adjoint valued via spinners of opposite chirality. And so the, uh, the Lagrangian is a sum of what we had before for young mills theory, plus we have the kinetic term for the scalars. We have a potential term, which is trace of phi commutative to phi bar squared. We have the kinetic term for uh, fermions and we have Yukawa couplings, uh, where I think I have a typo. Yes, uh, the question? Yeah, the minimal, um... Uh, characteristic is because why? I mean, uh, where, is where is reflected this point? It's minimal in the sense that, uh, so uh, if we just say, what's the minimal sp space of set of fields, which will, uh, So n equals two supersymmetry means that uh, it's a number of these theta variables, this kind of, this harmonic coordinates. So n equals two means we means that we take eight of them. So we have four bosonic variables x and eight harmonic variables theta, and so requiring that uh, in the decomposition of the field on that space of dimensions four slash eight. I have the gauge field, then um, that would fix the, the 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 rest of the field. So that, that will imply that I have scalars, uh, complex scalars, and have fermions. If I don't require gauge fields present, for example, then but but require scalars only, uh, scalars and fermions, then uh, the minimal set of Scalar fields would actually be two complex scalars uh, and the same number of fermions. But uh, we can take a smaller number of uh, fermionic variables, so four instead of eight, and that would be n equals one theory. Uh, so it will not have the so the minimal, minimal uh, super annulus theory with n equals one supersymmetry will not have scalars in it. And without scalars, uh, we cannot do the analysis which we will do now. So it's just that, unfortunately, it's the minimal number of fields for which we can uh, say something exactly 
and uh, yet something from Shiva. So, um, as before, I mean, we need to, to do the analysis of subtle points uh, which will dominate the path integral. And even though it is quite complicated, the problem, supersymmetry somehow helps us. It selects uh, a certain subclass of subtle points, subtle trajectories. Um, so they turned out to be uh, so-called instantons, which are the uh, solutions to the equation, partial differential equation of the first order in, um, in, 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 in derivatives. So they, uh, I mean, I'm sweeping some details under the carpet, but I hope I sort of prepared you for, for what follows by the example in the quantum mechanics. Uh, so this equation f equals minus star f has no real solutions on Minkowski and space time. Uh, we can find complex solutions, or we can say that uh, let make, let's make time imaginary, something which I didn't like to do, and I don't like to do, uh, then we can find real solutions. Uh, we should not, I mean, be too serious about it. Uh, again, I try to explain why it is not so important, but uh, anyway, the uh, we can try, I mean, we can get a feel for what type, what kind of uh, solutions we'll get by making maybe a simple symmetric ansatz if we take the four-dimensional space-time and uh, do the radial decomposition of coordinates, um, introduce the radial coordinate R and um, some angles on the three-sphere, then uh, we can look for solutions of the form uh, a pure gauge, which depends on the angles of the three-sphere times some function, which depends on the, on the, uh, on the radius radial coordinate. So if you substitute this ansatz into the young mills uh, uh, action and integrate out the angle angles, you will get a, a Lagrangian for the unharmonic oscillator with the one which we discussed before in a slightly shifted uh, variable. So what played the role of the coordinate X is now essentially one half minus the minus F. When this function f is equal to zero, you get trivial gauge field. When the function f is equal to one, you get the gauge field, which is gauge equivalent to a trivial one. And so it's not surprising that this unharmonic oscillator potential has minima at zero f or at f equals to one. And so you can use the subtle points for the unharmonic oscillator to get some a class of solutions for the young mills theory. And um, one of them, one of them was found uh, in the uh, early 70s by beloved Polikov, Schwartz, and Tupkin. But then it was found uh, that typically these solutions have many, many parameters, many moduli. And they're also characterized by an arbitrary value of a charge. So the charge is the integral of the trace f with f of the space time. And uh, the solution, in order to solution, for the solution to contribute to the path integral, the action, the integral trace of f, which star f should be finite. And so mathematicians have proven that if this is the case for the solution on R4, then it will actually extend to a one point quantification of R4, which is the fourth sphere. Then we want to identify solutions which differ by gauge summation. And so when you do that, it turns out that you get a finite dimensional space of solutions, which is called the modular space of instantons. So it depends on, it dimension depends on K, on the charge K, and of course on the gauge group N. And the remarkable fact established by Atiyah, Hitch, and Greenfield, and Manin is that it's the space of parameters of the instanton solutions is actually one of the complex, 
is one of the examples of the complexified phase spaces of some auxiliary quantum classical mechanical systems. So it's going back to what we discussed at the beginning of the lecture, uh, namely, you can define, so you, you can identify this modulus space of instantons with a sort of reduced phase space of some classical mechanical system with symmetries. Except that now it's not just the space of oscillators, but it's a space of some matrices. So these are matrices operating in uh, uh, some k-dimensional vector space or mapping the n-dimensional vector space to k-dimensional vector space. And um, the, so the space of matrices have, has symmetries, which is just the symmetries of the space k. And uh, the discovery of uh, Atiyah, Hitch, and Rinton, and Manin was that you need to impose the constraints on these matrices, which are exactly the moment map constraints. So the moment maps, like we discussed before. So uh, it turns out that when you impose these moment map equations, divide by the remaining symmetry, you get the vector space, you got, sorry, you get the modular space of finite dimension, which parameterizes instanton solutions. And then the gauge theory path integral exactly reduces to the sum of integrals over those modular spaces of some closed differential forms, which one gets by careful expansion of the youngness of the super angular section around these instanton solutions. Now, uh, some steps which are involved in this uh, discussion actually deform the Young Mills theory slightly using the rotational symmetry spin four, which is the uh, spin cover of a rotational symmetry SO4 of four dimensional Euclidean space. So we modify the Young Mills, uh, the super Young Mills action, at least this bosonic part, in the following way. So we don't touch the Young Mills part. But the kinetic term for the uh, scalar fields is modified by adding to the covariant derivative of the scalar field certain terms proportional to the curvature of the gauge field. And here I'm using the vector field V on space time, which is essentially a linear combination of two orthogonal rotations in two orthogonal planes with some coefficients epsilon one, epsilon two, which are actually in general complex coefficients. So we have epsilon, epsilon bar, epsilon two, epsilon two bar. We also use Higgsing. So we, we work in the background where the, uh, the field phi has a non-trivial vacuum expectation value at infinity. It's, it's actually forced on us by the potential, uh, original potential term, the commutator phi with phi bar, uh, squared is a potential, so at low energies, the commutator should vanish, and that means that phi can be diagonalized into a maximal, into the complexification of the maximal torus of the gauge group. So upon this deformation, it's a small deformation of the theory. So I, I think of epsilon as, as small parameters. Uh, What's non trivial is that this deformation is compatible with some of the supersymmetry, and it can be done in such a way as to preserve the exact, exact uh, exactness of the subtle point contribution to the path integral. So then, this integration of the instant on moduli spaces acquires an additional. Uh, exponential factor, which uh, is the norm squared of the vector field on the modular space of instantons, which represent rotations and constant gauge transformations. Yes, please, it was a question. So uh, what were this, uh, um, and this is, uh, I mean, a, um, AM, this vector A, I mean, what is, what is this? 
So once, so remember, yeah. we had the field, field, the field of phi, field right. phi, scalar field phi in, in my theory. So the field phi is a, so it's a quantum field. We, we integrate over the field phi. Uh, sorry, where was it? Uh, yes, so phi as well as A are dynamical fields. We want to compute path integral over this field. Yeah. But uh, the value of phi at infinity is a parameter. And so I denote this value by ball trace A. And as I tried to explain, at low energies, this value is not a general end by matrix, but it's actually a diagonal matrix. So phi is the end by matrix. It's phi is the adjoint valued field. And at low energies, phi commutes with its conjugate. And so it means that by U interrogation summation, phi can be made a diagonal matrix. But it's diagonal entries are in general complex numbers. So I want to compute the, in, the kind of a volume of the instant moduli space as a function of this uh, scalar expectation value A and of the, as a function of the parameters epsilon, which I used in deforming my theory. How, how did you show that it's a uh, diagonal? It's, it's, it's follow from what? Which, what? Okay, so, uh, so remember, so we have this term, uh, in the young new section, which is trace commutator phi phi bar squared. And uh, remember, my goal is to understand something about the effective, effective theory, the theory which describes low energy configurations. So in doing this, I can expand around the uh, field configurations which minimize the action, minimize the energy and action also. And so, in the first approximation, we just say set the potential term to zero. So if phi can use with phi bar, uh, you can decompose if you like phi into the real and imaginary parts, write phi as phi one plus i phi two, where phi one and phi two are Hermitian matrices. Then phi commuting with phi bar means that phi one commutes with phi two. So you have two Hermitian matrices which commute. <laughs> So you can diagonalize one of them, let's say phi one, but then phi two commuting with phi one would mean that yeah. it should be diagonal on the same basis. So then phi one plus i phi two is just diagonal matrix with complex eigenvalues. So I denote them by a one to a. Yeah. What's not trivial, I did not explain this, and that's a consequence of supersymmetry is that this integral over the modular space actually depends on a epsilon one, epsilon two, but does not depend on a bar, epsilon one bar and epsilon two bar. It's a holomorphic or rather meromorphic function of these parameters. Uh, it's something which I do not have time to explain, but it's a combination of the characters we discussed earlier. What's another point which is, we kind of mentioned earlier is that, yes, Yeah, okay, I understand this uh, uh, two parameter epsilon one, but how did they appear uh, in the theory? So they appear through the yeah, deformation. Here. So the yes, spectral field B, epsilon one, epsilon two, and I deform my action in this way. But they're, they're I mean, and my question is they are fixed by, by something or they are general? By hand, I fix them by hand. I just, I just said, I don't know how to solve the theory as it is, let me deform it first, solve the deform theory, and then try to remove the deformation. That's the idea. And you have only two, uh, two parameter, I mean. Only two uh, parameters. Yeah. I only have epsilon one and epsilon two. For general n. For general n, right. So for any n, so the fact that I have two parameters epsilon one and epsilon two have to do with the fact that I work in four dimensions. In four dimensions, the rotational symmetry has rank two. And so that's why we have two epsilons. So that, now let me speed up a little bit. Uh, so this integral can be can, uh, further simplifies. 
and can be computed by the fixed point formula. So it's just analog of the fixed point formula for the character we had before for the enharmonic oscillators, except that now these fixed points are labeled by many, so there are, uh, there's a, some combinatorics. So now the fixed points are collections of N Young diagrams uh, whose total size is equal to k. We'll recall later what 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 are, what are those. So this is used by certain additional trick which uses further deformation of the theory by making the bosonic coordinates on space time not quite commuting. Uh, mathematically, it means that one works with shifts as opposed to vector bundles. And um, so the result of that is that you can actually find the fixed points inside the modular space of instantons as opposed to the as opposed to outside. So for each uh, so each of these lambdas is the it's a picture like that it's a collection of squares arranged into their rows and columns, and the total number of squares is the size also known as the absolute value of lambda. And so I just need to enumerate all collections of lambdas such that the total size is equal to k. It's a large but finite number of such objects. And one also needs a generalization of gamma function, sometimes called Barnes or two gamma function. So it's a solution of the uh, functional equation which uh, uses the shifts by two parameters, epsilon one and epsilon two. And so it's a, so it's a kind of a next level gamma function. So, uh, the contribution of each fixed point can be written uniformly as a kind of a uh, exponential of some kind of a energy, which uh, is written in terms of a profile of the collection of partitions. So for each partition or Young diagram, you draw a piecewise linear function by taking Young diagram, rotating it, and then completing it to a uh, piecewise linear function extending to infinity. And then for n such diagrams, you take the sum of those profiles. So here are the examples. Uh, this is for n equals to three. Uh, so this is a profile for trivial partition. So all three lambdas are just empty, nothing. And so when you take the sums of these profiles, you get this um, piecewise linear function with three wiggles. Now, once you add partitions, then these wiggles become more, more complicated. So these are some examples of, of, of non-trivial and non-charge. And so in general, these uh, contributions, in addition to the exponential formula, it also has explicit formula with some products over the uh, boxes in the Young diagram. This is just explicit rational functions times this gamma function. And so the path to the effects of theory using these uh, ideas is to compute this partition function and then study its asymptotics when epsilon one, epsilon two go to zero, because that's when we go back to the original theory. So it turns out that this partition function has the, it exponentiates and the leading asymptotics has the first order pole epsilon one, epsilon two with coefficient of this leading divergence determining the effective low energy effective theory. So this function f will tell us what's the effective kinetic term for the scalars for n minus one complex scalars, which will be the re relevant degrees of freedom at low energies. And for the uh, photons, so the effective gauge couplings and theta angles for the n minus one photons, which are in, in the same vacuum multiply and plus fermions. So it's important to use the electromagnetic duality, which we described, which is discussed before, because that type of action will not describe unity theory globally if F was a globally holomorphic function, because then somewhere this imaginary part of tau will cross zero and uh, it will not be positive definite action. But fortunately, electric magnetic duality makes uh, uh, F globally defined not as a function but as a something more sophisticated, such that the action is actually positive definite everywhere. 
So uh, to find what this capital F is, uh, one studies uh, special observables. So it's some, it's some auxiliary construction. Uh, so for each uh, lambda, for each collection of Young diagrams, we define a certain rational function of uh, auxiliary variable X. Yes, Daniel? Okay, so using those uh, Y observables, one proves that a certain combination of Y uh, and one over Y has no poles in the variable X under expectation value. And so that allows you to connect contributions to path integral from different instantal sectors. And so this is the generalization of Dyson Schwinger equations, which usually associate with small deformations of integration counter in the path integral and use, leads to various equations, sometimes useful. Uh, so this is how matrix models at, in the planar limit are usually solved using those equations. Uh, in gauge theory, we have summation of instantal sectors and these Dyson Schwinger equations, which I just described, they use large deformations of path integral counter, which jump, allow you to jump between different instant sectors. And so, uh, so these Y observables are built out of the scalar in the vector multiplet and naively they are polynomials, but uh, as we just saw, uh, I did not derive it for you, but uh, it's a computation which shows that an instant background is Y observables have poles, but there are certain combinations of Ys such that expectation values do not have poles. And so in the limit when epsilon one, epsilon two belongs to zero, these Dyson Schwinger equations become an algebraic equation. Uh, so the fact that the left hand side has no poles and behaves as a polynomial for large X implies that it's always a polynomial. And therefore you have a relation between Y and X. And from that, so the parameters of this relation, the coefficients of this polynomial right hand side can be fixed by computing the periods of a differential X dy over Y. So that in order to understand why we need to compute those periods, we need to go to the, uh, back to the definition of the Y observable and see that this integral precisely will pick up the uh, Coulomb parameters A, the eigenvalues. So what happens is that for, uh, in the sum over the fixed point on the instant moduli space, uh, every individual contribution to y function has poles and zeros. But in taking the limit epsilon one, epsilon two to zero, uh, these poles and zeros they sort of accumulate and become cuts. And so on the x plane, they condense into n cuts around the positions of the eigenvalues a1 to a n. And then uh, because of the, because this equation has two solutions for given X. So the Riemann surface of the, uh, of the Y function is actually has two sheets and it defines a, a, a genus n minus one curve where you can also compute the B cycle periods of this differential X dy over Y. And one can prove using the standard Riemann identities that this one form dA, dA dual is equal to zero. And that means that locally there exists a potential which expresses A dual through A. And that's the prepotential F of the uh, effective theory. So that connects to the beginning of the talk where it turns out that this uh, curve is actually a spectral curve for a certain integrable system, a complexified integrable system. It describes a system of particles uh, with now coordinate Z and momenta X, apologize for the typo, uh, with, which interact with some kind of exponential potential. And uh, there is an auxiliary linear problem which has this gauge theory origin from which you can generate other Hamiltonians which will Poisson commute with the Hamiltonian H2. And um, so the curve will, will be the consistency condition for this auxiliary linear problem. And then uh, the Jacobian of this curve will be the torus of which the dynamics of this integrable system takes place. So uh, 
Further, one can uh, generalize the story to more general gauge theories, not just the minimal superannuals, but various theories with matter fields. And there is a classification of such theories by uh, AD Lincoln diagrams. You can also uh, realize such gauge theories in string theory in various ways. And so there is a similar analysis for, for theories which have string theory realization. You can, uh, so in my story, I introduced this deformation by parameters epsilon out of convenience. And so the original problem of computing the effective dynamics of superannual theory was uh, recovered in the limit epsilon to zero. But it turns out that the theory, and that's one of the examples of you know, something which is natural, mathematically and beautiful. But uh, if you if you go, go on with it, you get something interesting physically. So it turns out that the theories at finite epsilon are also quite interesting. And uh, in particular, if you take a special case when epsilon one equals minus epsilon two, uh, then the instant, instant partition function of the four dimensional gauge theory will coincide with a topological string computation on some local Calabi-Yau threefold where the parameter epsilon will be the string coupling constant, something which measures the genus of the uh, uh, string bulk sheet. I'm almost done, so let me just finish and then I will ask question, answer questions. Um, if you take a different limit when epsilon two is zero, but epsilon one is finite and is equal to h bar, then you get something which relates to quantization of the classical integral system, which underlies the zabit witten geometry. If you take both epsilon one and epsilon two non-zero, you actually get, uh, so this partition functions of instantons will compute something about conformal field theories in two dimensions, analytically continued. Instead of doing instantons on R4, you can work on more general four manifolds and toric manifolds for which, which allow uh, epsilon deformations. And doing uh, gauge theory computations leads to non trivial predictions and then theorems about two dimensional conformal field theory and the theory of isomonodromic equations. You can also lift uh, four dimensional theories to five dimensions. And uh, that will lead to the story of uniform CFTs and relativistic integral systems. You can lead to six dimensions, and that leads to double elliptic integral systems, uh, and so on. There is also some developments uh, where the four dimensional theory or five dimensional theory are replaced by six or seven dimensional theories, which now have three epsilon parameters because of the you know, larger rotational symmetries. And that would lead to models of crystal melting and quantum space-time foam, Donaldson Thomas and Grom Whitney correspondence. And I saw from, from your uh, talk schedule that you will have some, you will have Richard Thomas speaking later this year. So that's the T in this uh, DT correspondence. And you can also lead to eight plus one dimensional theories, uh, which will have now four epsilon parameters, which nevertheless are required to sum up to zero. And that leads to the theories of four dimensional crystals and oscillations of a three dimensional space. And uh, I think you will have also some speakers working on related topics later. Uh, Kao and maybe uh, Martin Kuhl. Yeah, Martin Kuhl will be there in. in yes. So that's, the, so that's the um, story I call Magnificent Four. So it's a. Uh, Four dimensional realization of the two dimensional young, uh, two dimensional young diagrams. And so there are always extra dimensions in the stories. And so I apologize for going over time. What do you think is like the main reference for, for this talk? I think it's hard to, to say just one because it's hard. Yes. So, um, so the main, I mean, advancement uh, in this story uh, was. Um, so the, this approach with localization and uh, so the ability to come to reduce the path integral of gauge theory to something finite dimensional and to compute this finite dimensional integrals that was done in my work 
uh, in 2002, so almost 20 years ago, but uh, be able to analyze this finite dimensional integrals was possible, so was uh, kind of done in uh, my work with uh, Andrei Okunkov in 2003 in, in um, some set of examples, and then understood more generally in my work with Peston in 2012. And then uh, the, uh, the main technical tool, which I used uh, uh, was this non-perturbative dyson schwinger identities. And so I had a sequence of, I think five papers on that topic called BPS CFT correspondence starting in 2016. And then uh, uh, maybe through 2019, uh, 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 yes, through 2019. So, I mean, it's, uh, there are many papers and it's even two hours is not enough to, <laughs> to make an overview, but uh, I yeah, hope I have so really general just... idea. Is there okay. any other question? Yes, I think there was a question which I- Oh yeah. Yes. Okay, thank you very much for the ni nice lecture. I have some question. Um, mm. Um, the, uh, you mentioned the case when epsilon one and epsilon two are different from, from zero, yeah. and this is related to the uh, to the to the CTFT, right? Uh, yes. Some conformable theory. Uh, the question is, uh, but this is the the uh, there is su such kind of relation for su uh, supersymmetric CFT. Uh, no, no. So it's uh, so supersymmetric gauge theory in four dimensions. No, I mean uh, this has relation some connection to non-supersymmetric CFT in two dimensions. So that I mean that's that's a claim which I'm, I'm making. So the this is called the BPS CFT correspondence. So CFT in this correspondence is non-supersymmetric. It could be supersymmetric, but it doesn't have to be supersymmetric. But the gauge theory in four dimensions is supersymmetric. So that's the type of correspondence I'm talking about. Yeah, but uh, if the CFT is supersymmetric, there is such that yes. type of correspondence? Yes, yes. So what is the, what is the, the, the... So, so there was a, uh, so I should say that BPS CFT correspondence is not, uh, it's not yet a complete dictionary. So it's just, um, I mean, it's, it's, it, we have some partial dictionary. So, uh, and so one example, which was found, I believe by Bernstein, Fagin, maybe Belavin, was that uh, if you replace R4 by an orbifold of R4 mod Z2 on the gauge theory side, okay. then uh, for a class of gauge theories, you will get something like super liberal theory on the, in two dimensions. So it's a supersymmetric version of Liouville conformal field theory. Um, and if you replace R4 by R4 mod Zn, uh, you'll get some kind this of- This super Levy and this super Levy is it, it's uh, have some uh, dual description in turn of, of, of this instant of- Yes, yes. These are of, instantons which live not on R4, but on R4 mod Z2. I see. Uh, and one more last question. Uh, I see some uh, slide before. More general M4. Yes. I see a slide before. Uh, it's like you have some uh, du uh, duality or relation with AD model. I mean, you mean some lattice model? Oh, there was some AD. 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 Exactly. AD. Yeah, yeah. So a <laughs> these are AD uh, types of, okay, so AD classifies gauge groups and matter fields. And so this is on the gauge theory side and the CFT, uh, uh, not so apart from the A type, what is the two dimensional CFT if any is not known, what, what does correspond to those? So this is, so it's a, you see, it's a partial dictionary. So we have, here we have something, we have more knowledge on the four dimensional side than we have on the two dimensional side. Thank you.
Uh, is there any other question? If there's no question, let's thank Professor Nikita Nekrasov. Muchas gracias for the seminar. Okay, muchas gracias. Okay, bye bye. Bye bye. Have a nice day. Thank you.